Welcome in. It is Big Ten Today. Great to have you with us, Dave Repson and Howard Griffith. Rafael Davis will be here as well. We will talk some hoops, a couple games in the Big Ten tonight. But football is front and center, Howard. It is. Big day for Purdue. It really is. Uh, you know, they obviously losing Coach Brom is a huge loss for the u- university because he did, I thought, some tremendous things, not only on the field, but with the game experience that was going on there. It was definitely a program that's headed in the right direction. But the future is bright with the young man that they have and Coach Walters is now going to lead that program. Fascinating to watch his growth and how he puts the program together. That is today's big story. It is Ryan Walters taking over at Purdue, formally introduces the school's new head coach one day after they announced his hiring. Certainly a very familiar name for Big Ten fans. Completely transformed Illinois' defense over the last two seasons as a unit that was among the worst in the league when he took over as a D.C. is currently leading the nation in scoring D heading into the bowl season. Walters is Howard alluded to replacing Jeff Brom, who left for Louisville. Howard, you have spent some time around Ryan Walters. We both have, but you've spent it going through X's and O's and really kind of picking his brain. Your thoughts on what Purdue is getting here? They're getting a bright, bright young star. And I think after sitting down with him, it was no question that to me he was ready to take that next step and become a, a head football coach and run his own program. But sitting down with him, I really got an opportunity to kind of get a feel for how he teaches, and how he expects his players to react. And sometimes that can be difficult. And you can be the smartest guy in the room, but can you get your players to buy in and make those types of adjustments? And he took me through one of the game films, I believe it's against Wisconsin. Wisconsin went down the field really quickly on him. And he said, don't worry, that's his message. Don't worry, we're in good shape. Everybody's like, well, why? (laughs) What do you mean? Well, we shut down their top two plays. So they had to go to some different things that they hadn't seen. He quickly fast-forwarded the film. They came back to some of those concepts they had success on, and they weren't able to make those plays because the players adjusted that quickly to what they had seen. So he does a great job of teaching and developing these young people. So there's no doubt he is a great defensive mind. I no think doubt. All you have to do is look at <laughs> what he's done here, taking the 97th uh-huh. ranked scoring defense that he inherited and turning it into number one in the country in the span of two years. But there are some issues here. One of them is that he is a defensive coach. It is hard for defensive coaches to call the plays while the game's going on. You have so much game management you have to deal with. There is the question at Purdue being an offensive-minded program when it has had its most success as to what the offense is going to look like. And you have the issue of being a first-time head coach. So as we unpack all of that, what are your biggest question marks in terms of taking everything you just described, which is dead accurate, Mm -hmm. right? This guy is so gifted and so talented, and taking that and making it into a successful head coach. Well, I think ultimately he has to... Now, it's just not about the defense. It's about offense. It's about special teams. It's about being able to manage that staff room. It's about being able to manage the back end, recruiting, NIL, having to not manage it, NIL, but also try to stay on top of it to make sure that you're bringing in all the right components that you're going to need to take this program to the next level. And, And those are things he'll have to deal with. But that's part of being a head coach. That's part of being a first time guy. And he clearly. Uh, blew the doors off of this administration at Purdue to be able to get this job. He says he's ready. They believe he's ready. And now he'll just have to adjust. It's going to be a learning process. I mean, you're not going to walk into this thing and then all of a sudden win a national title. It's going to take steps. There are going to be mistakes made on the way. But you have to be smart enough that you can correct those mistakes and that you make the right coaching hires to make this team successful. He spoke a little bit about his offensive philosophy, and I'm going to ask him more about that. We're going to speak to him here coming up a little bit later in the show. What stood out when you heard him describe, though, what they are going to run offensively? It looks like they'll be wide open, right? They're going to be multiples. He talked about 11 personnel. He talked about 12 personnel. But I think at its core, when he's interviewing this offensive coach, offensive coordinator candidates, he's going to be wanting that person who gives his defense uh, issues. And that's the type of style that he'll be looking for. And I think that's going to fit what, when you think about what Purdue has done in the past. That's going to fit. And let's remember, this year Purdue, it's not that Purdue never wanted to run the ball, 
but they were struggling. I think that was a lot about what was up front. So they would try. They just wouldn't have success with it, and they had to get away with it. Now I think you, if we've uh, talked to Coach Walters. He wants to be more balanced. Everybody wants to be more balanced, but he also wants to be explosive. So, you know, I, I think we have to take a wait-and-see approach, but I don't think there's anything to be concerned about that all of a sudden this is not going to be a team that can go out and put up the points that are going to be needed. So those are the big picture questions. What about kind of in the micro? What about going from today to tomorrow to next week? <laughs> Signing day is coming up here. He's got to assemble his staff. You got to keep kids out of the yep. portal. You got to get kids <laughs> yeah. to join your program from the portal. What does this next few weeks look like? For well, him? I think you think about this now. I mean, is he not going to have anything to do at, at Illinois? Right. How is that going to work? So I think that'll be he'll give us some great insight on that later on when you speak to him. But I think the staff is going to be important. Recruiting the kids that are right down on that roster is going to be very important. It's going to be busy. It'll be quite a few sleepless nights. But that's why you get the corner office in the big bucks, because you've got a lot of things that you've got to try to get done to really secure this class that's coming in. You talk about evaluating the portal, trying to figure out who all you absolutely need and where the holes are in the program. So he's got a lot of work ahead of him, but he's got to put a staff together really quickly. And when I say really quickly, he still has got to make sure that they're the right people that are going to be the right fit long term for him. And, of course, he is not the only one in this spot. The Big yeah. Ten West, three new head coaches, Matt Rule and Luke Fickle as well. Howard, great stuff. It's been fun. Appreciate the insights <laughs> and uh, still plenty more to talk about as we change the focus at least temporarily from the new head coaching hire in West Lafayette to the college football playoff. Purdue, of course, is headed to the Citrus Bowl to battle LSU. They're one of nine Big Ten teams headed to the postseason. First time ever. That includes two in the CFP, Michigan and Ohio State. You see the Big Ten, the fourth conference to have two playoff teams in the same season. One was kind of a technicality, though. 2020 was the only year that Notre Dame competed as an ACC member. The SEC has done it twice, including last year. And for more CFP talk, we are joined now by Fox Sports lead game analyst Joel Klatt. Joel, let's start with Michigan. As we know, it did not go well for them in the playoff last year. Now you're looking at this year. First of all, the team they're playing, with all due respect to TCU, who's really, really good, I don't think is quite at the level of Georgia. But from Michigan's point of view, are there ways which you feel like maybe they are better constructed this year to succeed in the playoff than they were a year ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do. And, and that's what's, you know, it's been so odd this year to try to say that, hey, I think this, this year's Michigan team is, is better. Uh, because it was, it was such an amazing year in 2021 with that, you know, culminating with that win over of Ohio State at home. But this is a better team. I think that they're better at the line of scrimmage. So first and foremost, you know, that that's that's a huge plus. Their offensive line is a little bit better. Their defensive line, in particular in the interior, is better. And while they don't have the individual pass rushers like maybe they did with Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo, I think as a rotation, they've done a really good job of, of creating pressure on the edge. Um, this is a team that also, by the way, their identity and their chemistry comes through in large ways, in particular late. They've continued to develop from a strength perspective. They're much stronger at the line of scrimmage on each side, like I just talked about, which allows them to be better in the second half of games. They're one of the best second half teams in the country. And then there's also the, the, the confidence factor. They believe that they're a better team. And it's not just, hey, we're, we're glad we're here. They have a purpose to being where they're at this year as opposed to last. Uh, I think last year the, the goal was to beat Ohio State, maybe win the Big Ten. And they were able to do that and then didn't play quite as well against Georgia. And the last thing that I would mention, too, is I do think that their quarterback play is elevated. Um, the, the ability of McCarthy to take – them to the next level with his legs and then throwing the ball down the field gives them a little something extra than what they had a year ago with uh, with all due respect to Cade McNamara. What does TCU do that might pose the biggest challenge to Michigan? I think it's their ability to create big plays and, and they can do that a number of different ways. 
on the offensive side. They've got three guys that I just think are excellent players. Excellent players. And that, by the way, they're good up front as well. Uh, their offensive line is veteran. They're, they're solid. But these three, they kind of have the, that traditional three-headed monster at the, on the offensive side. Their quarterback is an excellent player, Max Duggan. Uh, their running back, Kendry Miller, is a really good player and a guy that I think uh, might be one of the better backs that Michigan has faced all year long. And then on the outside, Quentin Johnston, he's also an NFL player. Like, he is a legit wide receiver threat that's long, he's tall, he's fast, and they can create big plays in any one of those avenues. They can throw it down the field. They can hand the ball off. Duggan can create with his legs like you saw late in the Big 12 championship game. So I think it's the number of different ways that they can pose threats. I think it's the big, biggest challenge that Michigan is going to have. And, and this is an offense that won't go lightly, by the way, because it doesn't matter how many times they've been down in games. They've been down double digits, I mean, a, a bunch of times, and they just keep fighting. You know, it's, it's a bad analogy, but it's the guy at the bar that you just don't want to fight, right? Like, it just doesn't matter how hard he gets hit. He's coming back for more. That's TCU in a lot of ways. They will continue to fart or fight regardless of what happens during the game. Their resilience has been incredible this year, and it's impossible to miss it if you follow them. It has been remarkable, and I think Duggan personifies it, right? Even in the game yeah. that they lost against Kansas State. I mean, the, the fight he showed down the stretch was really pretty remarkable. Let's flip to the other Big Ten team in the playoff, that, of course, being Ohio State. And when you and I spoke in that interim week between the game against Michigan and the Big Ten championship game, and we did a little bit of a postmortem on what happened to the Buckeyes, you spoke about the line of scrimmage and how mm -hmm. Michigan was better on the interior of the line of scrimmage, really both sides of the ball. So now here Ohio State gets another shot at this. When we thought they were done, <laughs> here they get a chance to come back. Is that something that you can rectify, Joel, in six weeks? I mean, it feels to me like that's a, hmm. a six-month problem and not yeah. a six-week problem. But, but is that something where they can overcome it and be a national champion? Yes. I mean, they can't overcome it. Listen, there was a couple of plays in the game against Michigan that if they go the other way, you know, for instance, they had they had the fourth down early in the game. They're up 10 to three and they, they throw the ball to Cade Stover and, and it just kind of out of his reach. If they score there and go up 14 points, you know, I think that was early second quarter. That's probably a different game and we'd be singing a totally different tune than this, you know, oh, they got bullied again. And the reality is, is, you know, after watching the game back a few different times on, on the coaches tape, it was more scheme than it was just the fact that they got beat up at the line of scrimmage. The yardage at the end looks way worse than what it actually was during the game. They had given up 86 yards rushing uh, at the 723 mark of the fourth quarter. So they had done a nice job, but they just continued to play such aggressive style of defense that it left some areas of the field uh, open to big plays. And then those big plays ultimately are, are what doomed them. Um, Ohio State is uniquely suited to threaten Georgia. Maybe not beat Georgia, but to threaten them. In this way, Rev, if you look at the last 38 games that Georgia has played, dated back uh, to the beginning of the COVID year, what you'll see is that they've won 35 of them. And in 34 of those games, they've given up less than 400 total yards. They're 34 and 0 in those games. They're 1 and 3 when they give up 400 or more. And in large part, that's due to the passing game. And that's one thing that they struggled with against LSU. Now, granted, that game got a little out of hand, but LSU threw the ball on them as well as anybody has to the tune of over 500 yards. And if you're going to beat Georgia, you've got to throw the ball well, and you've got to create big plays. You think about what Alabama did last year in the SEC championship game with Mechie and, and Jamison Williams and Bryce Young. It was their ability to attack through the air that really hurt Georgia. They were hurting them again in the national championship game until Jamison uh, Williams went down. And so here comes Ohio State, and they have got one of the best passing attacks in the country. So are they uniquely suited to threaten Georgia? Yes, absolutely. I've said this also multiple times. Rev, if, if I'm Georgia and I'm looking at the possible outcomes of conference championship game weekend, I could have played USC, TCU, Michigan, or Ohio State. Of those four, the team that I would want to see the least is Ohio State. And that's the one that they've got. 
So, you know, I think that it's going to be a fascinating matchup, and it all comes down to whether C.J. Stroud in that passing attack has enough time to threaten the secondary of the Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah, when you finish first in the college football playoff rankings and your reward is a team that many people were debating for much of the year whether they ought to be first in the college football right. rankings, it speaks right. to exactly what you're talking about. It's a little bit of a dubious reward. I want to finish with the news of the day in the Big Ten. You have an interesting connection to Ryan Walters. You guys were teammates mm -hmm. at Colorado. Give us some insight into what makes him special and what Purdue's getting. Well, first of all, I think Ryan is going to be a, a phenomenal head coach. This was inevitable in a lot of ways. I know that he was up for several other jobs, including at Colorado. You know, Colorado took a huge swing at Deion Sanders and it landed, or else I think Ryan's probably in Boulder. Um, he is a phenomenal coach. He relates really well to the players. He's always been a very intelligent guy. Even when I met him when he was first 17 years old, when he came up to, to some workouts as a recruit uh, for Boulder. Very intelligent guy, understands the game. But I think one of the, his strengths was, was his ability, in particular last year, to make adjustments mid-game. Rev, if you actually look at that Michigan game where Illinois probably should have won that game, you look at the adjustments he made defensively, nobody made better adjustments against Michigan than Ryan Walters. And, and I think it's his ability to be nimble like that, learn under Brett Bielema, learn the structure of what a program is. I think that he's going to have a chance to be very successful. The one thing that I would say, and this is going to be interesting and he's going to have to fight this a little bit, is the fit. Because this Purdue team is built to win on offense under Jeff Brom. And that's the way that they've done it over the last couple of years, you know, and even dating back to Joe Tiller in many ways. And now here's a defensive oriented coach. And, and I'm just wondering, like, how, how is that going to fit uh, the culture of that program? Is, is he going to be able to turn them into a program like Illinois, which he just came from that ran the ball, played great defense and had a good year because of it? It is going to be the biggest question probably that will be asked of Ryan Walters. We're going to talk to him here in a few minutes and we will ask him just that. Joel Klatt, as always, really appreciate your time. Enjoy the CFP. We'll see you down the road here. And thanks for your time this year. Always means a lot to us. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you, Rev. And uh, always a fun time joining you. Back to the top story of the day. Ryan Walters introduces the head coach at Purdue has been a meteoric rise through the coaching profession for the 36-year-old that's been a coordinator for the past seven seasons, first at Missouri, and then, of course, the last two at Illinois, inherited a group that was 97th in the nation in scoring D, and this year they are number one nationally in that category as we head into the bowl season. Ryan Walters is today's big interview. He joins us now. Coach, congratulations. What has the last week been like for you as you went from candidate to the choice? Man, it's been uh, it's been crazy. You know, thank you for the congratulations. It's been a, a dream come true. Um, you know, obviously I had uh, goals and aspirations to to lead a program, and I'm just grateful that that is that opportunity has uh, come about um, here at, a, at such a great university like like Purdue. When did you first hear from Purdue, Ryan? Uh, last week, you know, I got a I got a phone call um, asking if if I would hop on a Zoom. Um, you know, I was ecstatic. You know, this is obviously this is a, a, a program in the Big Ten. I just played in a championship game, so this is a, a an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, hit the ground running. I made sure I was you know dotting all my eyes and crossing all my T's um, in, in in preparation for the uh, interview process. Um, then it happened pretty fast. I thought it was interesting that you kind of led in the press conference by talking about your history as an offensive player, your history as a quarterback. I don't think it's any secret that Purdue is a program that through the years has identified most with offense, obviously known as the cradle of quarterbacks. You describe quite a bit in your Q&A with the media kind of philosophically what your offense might look like. Can you give us a sense just in terms of a team? Is there a team that you watch? offensively where you say that's kind of what Purdue's going to look like? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say so much a, a team. Um, I think philosophy-wise, you know, we're, we're going to be balanced. And I, when I say balanced, I mean, if it's 
it calls for us to throw the ball around to win a game, then that's what we'll do. And if the next week it calls for us to run it, then that's what we'll do. Uh, we'll be creative with how we use our personnel and how we use our formations um, to make sure that defenses have to uh, cover the entire field, you know, from sideline to sideline and use all 11 players. Um, you know, I've got the, the benefit of, um, from my vantage point, of, of knowing what, what defenses don't like to see. Um, and so I, I definitely think that we can take advantage of that on offense um, and still be high, pro, uh, high, high prolific and, and scoring a bunch of points and bunches um, like they have done here in the past. You said at your press conference that you believe you're the best defensive coordinator in the country, and certainly the numbers would bear out. You've done an unbelievable job these last couple of years here in Illinois. What's the balancing act? We've talked a lot about this through the years as defensive coaches in the league have tried to call the defense while also being the head coach. It, it can be challenging, as I'm sure you're aware. What's the balancing act between going with what is your competitive advantage, which is calling a defense, versus managing all those other things that go into being a head coach? Yeah, that's, that's going to be something that I'll have to balance and, and, and figure out, right? Um, I do think that our, our advantage um, on the defensive side of the ball is, um, is that it is my expertise, but I also understand as a head coach, um, I got to be present on, on, in, on both sides in the locker room. Um, I am going to hire an offensive staff that I feel comfortable with to uh, put us in a, the right uh, circumstances and situations to have success on Saturdays. Um, and then when I feel comfortable that um, our defensive side of the ball um, can can call the game and um, operate, um, you know, at the level that I, I feel is uh, necessary to win and, and take it and, and uh, hopefully to make it grow to, to be better than I, than I have been, uh, then I'll do so. So I'm going to do whatever it is um, that's in the best interest of the program. Um, I'm going to be team first um, at the first and uh, foremost of um, what we're trying to accomplish in order to have success on Saturdays. You talk about your defense is kind of your secret sauce and that is your defense and it's unique to who you are. Part and parcel with what you are describing is passing that defense along to someone. I mean, other people are going to have to understand it to the same extent that, that you understand it. Are you comfortable revealing it to your staff? I mean, at, at some point, it feels like you're going to have to to have what you're describing here. Right. I mean, we did obviously we did that at, uh, at my previous uh, stop at Illinois. Um, but yeah, we want to we want to keep that that circle small. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, we're trying to win games. So there's, there's no uh, secrets once you're in the building. Um, everybody's an open book. Nobody is going to have any egos or, or care who gets the credit. Um, everything's got to be team first and, and trying to do its best for uh, the young men in the locker room to put them in situations on Saturday where, where they can have success. You grew up uh, around the game. You talked about it in your news conference. Your parents were pretty young when they had you. Your dad was going to Colorado to be a, a quarterback, and then he stayed at Colorado and, and went to law school. So you kind of grew up around the game in Boulder. What are your earliest memories of football? Man, I, I mean, my, those are my earliest memories. Um, seriously, I, you know, I remember being in the locker room. I remember uh, watching practice. Um, I always had a football in my hand, and I, I can't remember a life um, without ball. And so, you know, it is in me. Um, it is in my DNA. Um, and I'm just glad that I could continue to wear and bleed black and gold. Yeah, that works out well, color scheme wise. Tell me about Eric Bieniemy, the babysitter. Um, I would not recommend him as a babysitter. <laughs> um, very good offensive play caller, obviously. Uh, babysitting, not so much. Um, you know, he he uh, he has was as aggressive uh, then as he is now, um, and that that aggressiveness caused a couple stitches above the lip. Uh, Mom wasn't too happy about that. He, of course, was a teammate of your dad's, and I know babysat for you for a time at, at, at Colorado. Uh, this is always a big jump here, Ryan, to go from being a coordinator to being a head coach. Who will you lean on? Is Eric one of those people? I mean, obviously, he doesn't have the exact same experience, but certainly he's been a mentor of, of yours in the game. Who are some of the other people who have, who have made jumps that you can lean on to, to what it is to be a head coach? Yeah, you know, obviously I've spent time uh, with a lot of specifically defensive minded head coaches. You know, I spent time with, with Mike Stoops, uh, spent time with Dan McCartney, uh, spent time with Bob Stoops, uh, spent time with Barry Odom, and then obviously now I spent time with uh, Brett Bielema, who, who um, all were, were stellar defensive coordinators and all had success. 
um, as head coaches in the collegiate level. Um, you know, they've, they've, all of those guys to a T have reached out and congratulated me. Um, and I'm just grateful and thankful for uh, their leadership, their, their mentorship, um, and their example of some of the things that, that I can take with me uh, here at Purdue University um, to have success hopefully uh, come next season. I saw one of your first orders of business was to put Devin Maccabee on scholarship. I got to tell you, I think I could have figured that one out, but uh, <laughs> he obviously is just phenomenal. It's such a great story this year. Beyond that, beyond kind of integrating yourself with the current players, what do you have to do? I mean, there's so many moving parts here. You got a staff you got to put together. You got signing day coming up here next week, putting the class together and holding the class together probably more importantly. You've got to monitor the portal, who's leaving, got to figure out who's coming. They're preparing for a bowl game. Like, wh what are you doing here in, in the next week, aside from obviously not sleeping? I mean, geez, man, you're trying to stress me out with all the <laughs> things I got to do. Makes me want to get off the call and go to work, you know what I mean? Um, uh, but, you know, just like you said, all those things are, are all things that I'm, I'm doing on a, a, a constant basis, right? And, and sleep uh, will be um, hard to, to come by. Uh, here in the, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, but that's okay. That's what we signed up for. I know my, my phone is, is buzzing right now as we speak. Um, you know, I, I'm excited to get to know the, the young men in the locker room first and foremost. Um, you know, I've been on the phone with recruits, um, specifically those that are committed and, and those that are uh, arriving at mid-year, um, you know, trying to put together a staff and, and, and interview the, the guys that are currently on staff. Um, and then trying to find a, a home and a place to lay my head um, and get my family out. Um, those are all things that, uh, uh, that we have to deal with right now as, as, as head coaches when uh, there is transition. Um, but that's what you sign up for. You did say that you would be at the bowl game, but you would not really be involved in the preparation for the bowl game. To what extent might you drop by practice just to get a sense of who you have personnel-wise, like what you're inheriting and where they may fit into what you want to do? Yeah, so like if I am at practice, it won't be in an evaluation uh, capacity. I want those guys to, um, you know, play free, practice free, and, and really um, put a stamp on the end of a, the successful season that they've had and that I was not a part of, right? So I want to allow them uh, that opportunity to, to close it out the right way. Um, and so, you know, I love football. And so if there's practice being had, like I'll, I'll be there as a spectator. Um, same with, with the bowl game. Um, really looking forward to being able to hang out and, and get to know the guys um, and then hopefully watch them uh, go get a W against the LSU Tigers. Ryan, last question. If you are doing this right, what do you want people to say about Purdue? In other words, you play a game against Purdue and they come out of it in the post game and they say, man, they do this really well. What is this? They play together. Uh, they play smart. They play tough. They play physical. Um, they, they play the game the way it's supposed to be played. Well, Ryan Walters, look forward to watching you put your distinctive stamp here on Boilermaker Football. Congratulations. Get to work. Tend to that cell phone. And we'll talk to you soon here down the line. Thanks for having me. What a season for Marvin Harrison Jr. in Columbus. The sophomore became Ohio State's first ever unanimous All-American. That was marked today with his addition to the AFCA All-American team. He's a finalist for the Blitnikoff Award, was a finalist. A Big Ten Receiver of the Year won that award. First Buckeye ever to capture that. Just a fabulous year. One of the main reasons Ohio State is headed to the college football playoff. And Marvin Harrison Jr. joins me now from Columbus and let's start with unanimous All-American again the first Ohio State receiver ever to do that I mean Chris Carter David Boston Chris Olave I mean all these great guys that you played yeah. with and, and great guys who preceded you over the previous decades what does it mean to be the first one ever to win that award in Columbus uh, it means a lot uh, it's such a blessing first and foremost I thank God uh, for being able to put me in some position but uh, a lot of hard work went into you know being a accomplish these awards so I'm just very thankful. A year ago at this point, you had five career catches to your name, right? Because this is before <laughs> yeah. the Rose Bowl when, of course, you kind of had your breakout game. What do you think about when you think about where you were a year ago and where you are right now? Um, I, I went through a lot, and then uh, I was very blessed to be able to sit behind Garrett and Chris and learn a lot from them um, my first year. I think they helped me out a lot. 
and um, we're just learning from them how they approach practice, how they approach the week, and preparing for you know, the opponents. I definitely learn a lot from them. Yeah, that is an incredible advantage, I would think, in Ohio State when you go into that wide receiver room. And not only do you have Brian Hartline coaching it, who's one of the best coaches in the country, but it's just loaded the with best. talent every year. Uh, you talk about Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, among others, obviously Jackson Smith and Jigba in that room as well when he got there last year. What did you learn from those guys? What are the things that you took from them that you applied on the field this year? Um, just how they approach the game. Um, I was Chris's roommate. You know, on the Friday nights before the games, and just seeing how he watched film, uh, taking care of business, you know, whether that's schoolwork or um, getting his homework and assignments done like that, and obviously watching film against the opponents and you know, seeing what he's looking for in the DBs and the techniques that um, you know, he's looking at. So I learned a lot in that aspect. Now, you are, of course, the son of one of the greatest wide receivers in the history of the game, a Hall of Famer. <laughs> How much did you work on that stuff with your dad? Like, what was kind of your level of film watching acumen and breaking down the game and breaking down routes and all that stuff when you got to Ohio State versus kind of where you are right now? Uh, I definitely learned a lot from him. Um, probably the biggest thing I learned from him which is how to approach practice. He always treated practice like it's the Super Bowl for him. So for me, it's, uh, every practice is a national championship for me. So, um, and obviously the techniques and little things about being a receiver, uh, the things I took away from him the most. You grew up in Philadelphia, which of course is a great basketball town. And I know City, yeah. you loved basketball, really your first love. I did. <laughs> what made you gravitate from basketball to football? Uh, I realized I was better at football. Uh, I started <laughs> getting offers for football my freshman year. Uh, of high school, so uh, kind of knew football was the path for me. How much basketball did you still play through high school? I played my freshman year, and that was it. Just my freshman year. And right. then I still shoot jump shots here in the facility, here and there, uh, just get my shots up. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you go over to the rec center and, and try to run against any of the, the hoop <laughs> guys, or is it just... Uh, no, nah, nah. no. None of that, huh? Uh, how nah, much... We how, play... Uh, go ahead. I was going to say, we play uh, against the football team. We play each other sometimes. And we have fun like that. CJ, probably one of the best basketball players on the team. Uh, we're on the same team a lot. So uh, we make a good connection on the basketball court and the football field. Did you feel pressure at all to follow your dad onto the football field? Or was there, did you want to resist that and say, hey, I, I, maybe I will go the basketball route? Like, how does that work when your, your dad is so famous and so good at at a sport that you're thinking of pursuing? Yeah, and no, I think he kind of left the decision up to me, um, really. Uh, I think he would be fine with me playing basketball or if uh, I decided to follow his footsteps and play football. I think he'd been uh, good either way. And that's very important just to have that uh, openness with him. Um, so obviously I chose to follow his footsteps and got big shoes to fill. I know that the two of you go back and forth on Sundays watching NFL games and, and texting one another uh, you talked about kind of learning from him and learning about mm -hmm. the way he attacks practice how about X and O wise like wh what did you learn from him in terms of watching film and and breaking down what defenses are doing and, and route running and all that kind of the, the intricacies of the game uh, I think the biggest thing is focusing on yourself uh, at the end of the day the defender has to guard you so um, you know he has to react to you and what you do so uh, whether that's body language and a route and just making sure everything looks the same or you know high point of the ball uh, making contested catches things like that um, but that's probably the biggest thing I learned from him is just you know the defender has to react to you so really just focus on yourself and you know, your technique. We we're talking about Brian Hartline earlier and what an incredible job he's done with that wide receiver room what makes him so good why is he such a great coach above and beyond recruiting fabulous talent. You're right uh, I think the biggest thing is he's he connects to us like obviously he's been He's been in my position before. He's been an Ohio State receiver. Then obviously he's uh, played at a high level in the NFL. So um, you know, he's reached the goals that we all have. So we can learn from him in that aspect. And then I think the biggest thing with him is just learning you know, the mindset wise, you know, how he approached the game too. Um, so I think that's probably one of the biggest things I learned from him. Marvin, give me some insights into the emotions of this team after the loss to Michigan. I mean, obviously the game didn't go how we wanted to, but uh, we get a second chance, kind of to right our wrongs. And on December 31st, we got a big game against Georgia, 
uh, they're a really good team, so it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, give me a sense of the mindset. I mean, it's such a weird emotional roller coaster, right? I mean, I have to believe when you lost that game, you figured you probably wouldn't get a shot at the college right. football playoff. A lot had to go right for you guys, and it did. So what's the mindset now? Like when you found out, hey, here we are. We've got this new lease on life. Yeah, we were very excited, um, very thankful for the opportunity uh, as we go back and compete for a national championship. That's one of our goals uh, every year is to win a national championship. So uh, we have an opportunity to do that. Georgia is really good. They're an elite defense. They kind of hang their hat on the defense. What have you seen as you've broken down the film and watched them? You yeah, know, they're a great defense. Um, they play fast. They play physical. Uh, we definitely have to match their energy and uh, play, play aggressive. I think that's one thing we kind of got away from towards the end of the year, maybe a little bit. So uh, going into this game, we're definitely going to play aggressive. Looking ahead to next year, if, as expected, CJ ends up going pro, your high school quarterback, Kyle McCord, could end up being the, the college quarterback for yes, you could, yeah. as well. He's been the backup and, and certainly has played really well when he's gotten his opportunities. For people who maybe haven't seen him or don't know a whole lot about him, give us some insight into Kyle. Yeah, I think Kyle's probably one of my best friends. Obviously, on the, on the field, we have a connection there. But then off the field, uh, we have a connection you know, off the field, too, just you know, being friends. And then um, he's a great quarterback. He's uh, very smart, intelligent can read the defense, then obviously he has the arm talent to make all the throws necessary uh, a quarterback needs to make. I'm going to leave you with this. You mentioned you just finished finals yesterday. We were talking beforehand down the line. Yeah. You are a business finance major, which I assume <laughs> is uh, not an easy path to be taking. What's been the most interesting class you have taken in that major to this point? Um, the most interesting class would say probably my statistics class. Definitely been my hardest class. You know, I've been here so far, but uh, definitely been a challenge. But you learn a lot. Um, you know, this Fisher uh, College of Business here at Ohio State, so one of the top programs for business. So, well, speaking of statistics, you put up some awfully good ones this year. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> on Thank that, you very much. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. Really a pleasure to talk to you. Enjoy the rest of this practice leading up to the CFP, and we can't wait to see you out on the field in Atlanta. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me. That is As promised, he waited patiently, and now he joins the show. Rafael Davis joining us. Uh, let's start here with Minnesota. There are a couple games tonight, but from Minnesota's point of view, they're in the middle of a significant losing streak here. This feels like a get-right game for them. What do they need to do, Rafael, to kind of turn things around here after a rough start? I think they just got to find some consistency between Jamison Battle and Darcy Garcia. It seems that one of them have a good night, the other one struggles. The one has a good night, the other one struggles. You look at Jamison Battle in their last game against Mississippi State, goes one for eight from the field, only gets you five points and zero rebounds. He's six seven, six eight, playing that four position. If you can't score the ball, go hit the glass on defense. Go get a defensive rebound, push it in transition, try to get you an easy one, or get to the free throw line. He's only averaging two free throws per game so far this season. It's a guy that was able to get to the free throw line in bunches last season, make open shots. I know Minnesota and Coach Johnson expected him to be around 20 points per game, so him finding himself some consistency. Darson Garcia struggled a few games ago. The last two, he's been playing better. He's getting around 17 points per game over the last two games, six rebounds, shooting the ball well from the field, making some threes. But just about getting those two guys on the same page the same night, be able to score the ball. Minnesota's just not putting enough points on the board right now. Five straight losses for them. I think the good news is, at least on paper, these seem like some games here where maybe they can figure it out. We talked right. about Arkansas Pine Bluff tonight. They have Chicago State, Alcorn State, and it's not unique to them. I think there are a lot of teams in the Big Ten where this stretch between now and New Year's Day affords you an opportunity to kind of figure some things out. You've learned where your pluses and minuses are, and, and now you get a chance to, to – you know, make make those minuses right. But they have struggled really on both ends of the court, right, Fell. There's there's a lot to work on for Ben Johnson and company. Maryland, on the other hand, started off great. Mm -hmm. Eight and oh. Now they've lost two in a row here. They take on UCLA tonight. What are you watching for in this game for Maryland to try to get back on the winning track against what is a really good Bruins team? I think that's second half of that Tennessee game. They gotta play that way. They were forcing turnovers. They were getting out and ran in transition. Jameer Young really came to play and controlled the tempo of that game. But I also think they got to get Julian Reese going. 
He started the season on a high nose, averaging 15 and 9. His numbers have started to decrease a little bit. I mean, over the last four games, just averaging 7 and 7. And he's shooting the ball around 60% from the field. So it's not that he's being just not efficient around the rim. They just got to find a way to get him more touches, get him more looks. But this Maryland team, I believe, is going to go as far as Jameer Young takes them. Over the last couple of games, he's been averaging 20 points, four rebounds. I would like for him to get his assist numbers up, maybe in that pick and roll offense where you maybe hit Julian Reese as he was doing in that second half against Tennessee, able to get him seven, eight assists. Those two guys are going to be key in this one. But Dante Scott, Akeem Hart, this is going to be a guards game. It's going to be a perimeter-oriented game. All three of those guards and perimeters are going to have to play well for Maryland. This is their fourth straight game against teams that are currently ranked. Wisconsin was not ranked when they yeah. played them. They are ranked now. UCLA, interesting team. I mean, a team with a lot of weapons. Mm -hmm. It's a team that really kind of liked to grind it out early on in Mick Cronin's tenure, but this feels like a little more up-tempo mm -hmm. version of the Bruins. What's the biggest challenge you feel like they present to Maryland? I think that is the challenge, being able to run with them. And I think that goes to Maryland's advantage. You look at a team like Illinois with all the athletes being able to run and gun and kind of the tempo of that game. I think that fits Maryland well with the style of play of Akeem Hart, of a Dante Scott. The, way that he, the weight that he's lost has allowed him to get out and transition a little bit more. And then having an agile big like a Julian Reese, being able to run the floor rim to rim, it should help Maryland in that aspect. But Jamie Jacquez is a really good scorer. He could put the ball in the bucket. So guys like Akeem Hart are going to be have to make shots on offense, but also have his head on a swivel on, on defense because guy he's checking could go for 25-30 any night. And they have been really good defensively, even during this losing streak. I mean, they gave up 60 points per game. You feel like those are games you should be able to right. win. It's just hard when you make three field goals and a half to, to win a game. And unfortunately, that's what Maryland did last time out against Tennessee. Tennessee's really good. Yeah, they are. Defensively, but, but even still, you, you got to make more than three shots. A few more minutes with Ray Fell here. The Badgers into the national rankings this week for the first time all season. That's all well and good, but it is your rankings that really matter. <laughs> we, everyone in college basketball knows that. So let's count down the top five in the Big Ten. Where are you starting? I start with Wisconsin. I mean, Wisconsin is a team that was picked 10th in the preseason to finish in the Big Ten, but they're a team that just knows how to play basketball year in and year out. I love the way that Chucky Hepburn approaches the game with his toughness, his grit, and his attitude. Tyler Wall is that Swiss Army knife that could defend at a high level. He can make shots, post you up, get into the, his finishes. They have a half-court offense where when they need a bucket, they know who to go to and how to get it to them. And then on defense, they're sound. They move on the string. They make you take bad shots. They're starting to force more turnovers, getting more steals. I like this Wisconsin team, how they're built. They just know how to win. I mean, the last seven games, all decided by five points or fewer. They won five of them. It's what they do every year. Every year. I don't know why anyone would pick them 10th. You have to be absolutely insane. Who do you have at number four? Well, number four, I will go towards Ohio State. Ohio State has a unique ability, like a Purdue this year, to get old but also stay young. You look at Justice Suing, Zed Key, Likely in there, and McNeil. Those are guys that's been around college basketball. They know how to play in close games. But then you think of a freshman, Bruce Thor and Bryce Sensiball, that adds a pop to that lineup, a spunk to them. And when you have guys that's been there and guys that know how to play that are young, it normally leads to some success defensively. They're one of the better defensive teams in the league. And they're one of the better offensive teams around the country. Big one this weekend against North Carolina. And, of course, the Tar Heels have been one of the big stories in college basketball, not for great reasons <laughs> right. this year. We'll see whether or not Ohio State can kind of keep them down. So that's number four. Who's number three? Iowa. And Iowa's a team I could see winning the league. I mean, Chris Murray could be player of the year in this conference. This depends on his health. Patrick McCaffrey, he just stays consistent, stays aggressive. They can have one of the better wing combinations in the conference. I think Philip Robracha is taking a step this year. I think he's more comfortable in Coach McCaffrey's system. He's a guy that can get you 10 and 10 every night. And then Tony Perkins, Pate Sanford, those two guys just have to be consistent, be simple, play their role, and make shots at a high level. And I think this Iowa team can be special. Speaking of Chris Murray, Fran McCaffrey was on Big Ten Radio this morning with Anthony Heron and told him maybe still a couple weeks until Chris Murray comes back. They don't want to rush him back. So 
Right. Uh, interesting to see that. But, man, they, against Iowa State, they, they didn't need him. They were fabulous <laughs> without him. So we're down to two. Who's number two? Indiana. Indiana could be number one. They could be right there. I just, just think it depends on Trace Jackson Davis. When he wants to be the best player on the floor, Indiana could be the best team in the country. Xavier Johnson, Tamar Bates, you get Hushafino back. Miller Kopp is making shots right now. Their, their guards are doing their job. It's going to come down to how engaged is Race Thompson, how involved can TJD be for 40 minutes? This team could win a national championship, and their defense is sound. Their defense travels. I think it just comes down to the big fella. So much better than a year ago on the offensive end. That 100%. really just made a, a huge improvement. So number one clearly is the team that's number one in the country. Yeah, the Purdue Boilermakers. I mean, they just have a unique way to beat you. I mean, if it's not Zach Eady, one of their guards can step up. Fletcher Lawyer did it against Nebraska. You've seen games where Caleb First has come off the bench and finished the game because of his effort. They have four shooters around the big fella at all times. They throw the ball inside. When he's not having a great game, he has a unique ability to affect the game in other ways, rather be blocks or rebounding the basketball. He's one of the only guys in college basketball can control a game just with his rebounding. And when you have that guy in the middle, it normally works out for you. Defensively, they're a lot better just because they've committed to defending at a high level. I wonder about them forcing turnovers from other teams, being more disruptive on defense, but I think this team is sound right now. No Illinois, huh? Not yet. They gotta, I think they got to prove it to their coach with their toughness. They yeah. definitely got to prove their toughness to me, but I think if they could prove that and figure that out in the locker room, I definitely like the Illinois team. A week removed from beating the number two team in the country. Now, a few days removed from losing at home to Penn State, yep. so I get it. But I don't know. I think we'll hear from them But before I'll send up. But it's tough. you got to leave someone out. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Got to. It, it is not an easy <laughs> exercise. Uh, this was fun, action-packed day. Thanks for your patience. Yep. Uh, we will see you tomorrow on Big Ten Today.